future. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Brent Lee, a professor of integrated media at the School of Creative Arts at Windsor University in Ontario, Canada. He's an expert in sound and time-based art forms. Welcome, Brent. Hello. Tell us a little bit about yourself as an artist and then also how you balance your life between being a scholar and a creative artist. Okay, sure. I, if I knew how to balance all of those things, <laughs> I, would, I would be way better at, uh, way better off, but I try. Um, I was trained as a musician and studied music composition uh, at both at McGill University and the University of British Columbia. And... For many years, that was uh, primarily what I was doing, was composing music and teaching, eventually uh, teaching at, a, at the university level. Um, most of my music composition involved technology to some extent, using uh, either it was either electroacoustic music or I did a lot of work with uh, the live processing of the sound of acoustic instruments in concert pieces. And uh, eventually, I was also interested in improvisation, and eventually uh, started a group called the Electric Improv Lab at the University of Windsor with uh, some students and colleagues here who were very interested in improvising. And we would basically freely improvise with uh, uh, different kinds of technology at the same time. So we could process the sound or add in found sound and other things like that into the improvisations. And we eventually started working with some visual artists, uh, choreographer, dancers, um, just as a way of expanding what we were doing in terms of the improvisational work. And there were a few, a few people that we really enjoyed working with. And eventually we started in 2008, a group called the Noise Border Ensemble. And uh, that group is, is still, still exists. We still perform. We put on a festival every couple of years. And uh, the group is made up of musicians, uh, composers, uh, sound artists, but also video artists, uh, visual artists of different kinds. And we have often collaborate with uh, guest artists or, or work. If we're traveling, we'll work with other people as well. And for the last, I would say, I guess, 10 years now, that's been sort of a major focus for me is work on that, that project, the Noise Border Project. Uh, I continue to incorporate that in my teaching. And, and more recently, I've sort of I've moved over more to the visual arts side of uh, the School of Creative Arts, teaching courses in uh, time-based art, uh, media, sound and media, basically. And uh, I guess continue to, to do that work. Um, in the last, I guess, three or four years, we started doing, well, even longer, I guess, but with, with some more focus on installation art and interactive installations. One of my colleagues in the Noise Border Ensemble is, is named Siggy Tarinas. And she's been doing installation art for decades now. And uh, we had actually collaborated on a couple of her installations some years ago. But uh, now we've been working together for the last few years, building new installations, and especially installations that are interactive in nature, meaning uh, either that there's an audience participation or interaction in the installation, or what we're actually more interested in is how musicians might interact with an installation in a more... Uh, at a higher level than a typical audience member would. So that's actually what we've been working on. We just presented a new piece called Ex Vitro uh, in our festival this spring. And Ex Vitro is an interactive installation. It, it runs as an installation with an algorithm made in Max for both the audio and actually the, the video algorithm, I think is done in processing. But uh, the piece will run by itself uh, without any interaction but if someone does interact with the installation then it will respond to whatever sonic input uh, that performer can can offer and uh, create sort of a performance situation within the installation and we presented that for the first time yeah, in just in may we're still working on this piece we're still refining it and we hope to present it some other places soon what comes next really intrigues me, but before we get there, I would like to clarify a term. When you say technology, what do you mean exactly? Because it's not obvious. And if it's not too much to ask, I'd also like to ask you uh, to tell us a little bit about how this term has evolved 
actually, well, you know, how technology has evolved uh, since the beginning of your activity with it? Well, <laughs> I'm going to date myself a little bit. So when I say technology, I was thinking of, of two, uh, more than two things, I guess, maybe three or four things. First of all, more commonly now, I think of it as computer technology. So it's software, um, but also it, it's including electronic instruments or digital instruments that will produce sound, not acoustically, but, but through some sort of a, an algorithm or electronically. Um, it has also meant it sensors in some cases. We have, you know, done some projects that involve sort of do-it-yourself electronics where we're actually building circuit boards and using Arduino or something like that to connect them uh, to usually into Macs, but uh, even just to come to a computer to be able to do something. Um, originally, when I was saying, when I first started working with technology, it was with analog synthesizers. Um, at the university I was attending, we had a big Moog synthesizer that filled an entire room. And uh, so I did several pieces on that. But then uh, even I was still an undergraduate student when uh, MIDI came out and uh, the whole digital synthesizer thing really took off. And so since, I guess, the 1980s, uh, a lot of the, the pieces I did in the 80s and 90s involved, you know, black box synthesizers or audio processors, uh, meaning that it wasn't done with a computer and a, and uh well, I guess there's a computer inside inside the black box, but not a laptop computer or a desktop computer, just a piece of, of, of equipment, uh, outboard equipment. And gradually in the last, I guess, since since maybe the 2000 or so, that's evolved more so that pretty much everything we do now is, is in software. We obviously use a little bit of hardware, but uh, more and more it's we're relying on software instruments maybe some some interfaces or controllers or things like that but mostly it's uh, we're doing things in software and more recently i mean i started programming writing software in the 90s and and continued on with uh that was in c but i've continued on with more more developing max patches um since i guess almost 20 years now you're also an educator at academic level, so you're often in touch with young adults and the new generation that learns about this technology and how to use it for creative purposes today. I would like to ask if having been there when MIDI came out makes you an expert of several technological generations in a way that gives you a perspective that is more valuable or just different than that of, of these people who approach the, the scene today and take some things for granted, for example, a certain computational power, mobile technology, I would say the internet itself, and in general, ready-made tools and cheap plug-and-play devices. I don't think it's more valuable. It's different. I have a different perspective on it, but uh, I don't think it's any more valuable. In fact, sometimes it can be a little bit of a detriment because you get used to doing things a certain way. The technology evolves, and because you've been doing it a certain way for a long time, you don't, and it's working for you, you don't feel the need to to follow the newer developments. So, I try to. I'm not, but at the same time, I'm not. I'm more interested in the ideas that I come up with and what's possible, but I'm perfectly well aware that, you know, my students will sometimes come up with ideas that I would not have come up with just because they, they're they sometimes much more on top of the really recent developments in technology and they're more open. They don't have a, a maybe as, as rigid a view of, of how things should work with, with sound and technology. So um, I don't think it's an advantage. I think it's a bit of a disadvantage. I, I have to force myself actually to, to stay on top of it. How true is it that today's scene is dominated by ready-made technology as opposed to DIY, both in terms of software patches and tools and devices? I think it's I think it's a combination of both, and it's really up to the individual artist to how how they want to approach it. Um, for example, in our work with the Noise Border Ensemble, we have people that are familiar enough with Max to find a patch online and incorporate it into a piece, but really couldn't build it from scratch. We have people that can use a patch but couldn't fix it if there was anything wrong with it. Then we have people that could design something from scratch and 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 make it work eventually. So, and in the end, you know, for us, I think it's mostly about the the artwork. And however you arrive at the artwork is fine. We do take take care that if we are, you know, uh, 
using someone else's max patch that we try and credit them in the not only in the patch but in the performance we'll say you know this is based in part on a patch by so and so that we found in such and such a place uh but i don't i don't think there's any one way to do it and everybody starts out as a beginner some people go further some people never really get beyond that but for a lot of artists they don't need to be experts in max programming to use max or to you know the, the, you can use the simpler tools in max that sort of come with or ready-made patches and that's fine it, it uh, depends on what your artwork is and where you want to take it sometimes we hear that the more sophisticated building blocks and tools you have available to perform a creative task the more limited your imagination will be because instead of having a visionary idea you will look at the abundance of tools in front of you and just think in terms of what can i do with them I would like to ask if this is an issue for you. How do you find the balance? And also, how do you think that your students approach this issue? Yeah, that's uh, that's possible. I suppose that could be the case with with some artists that they might be limited a little way because the tool only or suggests certain ways of working. Uh, one thing with my students that I always tell them in the first class uh, when we're starting to work on with Ableton Live, which is at the workstation that uh, that I teach in my sonic arts classes because it's really simple to use and it's you can use it in live situations you could also use it for producing recordings um, I have a lot of students that are into sort of DJing and music production like that so it's a good tool for them and uh, but one thing that Ableton Live has is that it, it has a default tempo of 120 beats per minute and so it's amazing how many of the first assignments will come in and they'll be at exactly 120 because no one ever bothered to change the tempo because that was with so it's true you know your tools do steer you in a certain direction um at the same time with max you could because the tools are so flexible you can uh you can alter them even the ones that are sort of ready made you can still tie into them and still you know make changes or do something new on top of that and i think for a lot of a lot of people it's an entry into the world of working with sort of interactivity is to be able to use something that will allow you to do interactive work, even if it steers it in a certain direction, um, as, at least as a starting point. And you might, the more you get interested in it and excited about it, you think, well, what if I could do this or what if I could do that? And not everyone will do that. So, uh, but that's okay. I don't, I don't see that as a problem so much, but I recognize that it's an issue that, of course, a tool will, will have an effect on the kind of work that's produced. Sometimes I think that it's unfair to expect of artists who engage with the newest technologies to always have ideas that challenge or transcend the limitations of the current state of technology, because that's not what defines a good idea, a good artistic idea that has value. Maybe this obsession with pushing the boundaries is just a fixation of our times. A piano, for example, has 88 keys. And every composer is implicitly asking the question, what can I do with these keys? And if they don't feel the urge to transcend the limitation of the 88 keys, it doesn't mean that the composition won't be of value. So every artist is limited, but inspired, and ultimately just confronted with the specifics of, of his or her instrument. Oh, I totally agree. But that's also the same for scholarly work as well. If, if people have been studying certain ideas, certain scholars, certain researchers, certain authors, their, their thinking will be shaped by those, their, what they've read as well and limited in some way by that. So, or formed, or not sort of limited, but, but steered, I guess would be a better word. That's true. So I guess that owning your own decisions being aware of your own decisions. Basically, responsibility is the way out of this. Because there's nothing wrong with making a composition at 120 BPM with Ableton Live, but it makes a difference whether you chose that yeah. um, or not. That's all, yeah, that's all you can ask, I guess, is to be a little bit of aware of the, the decisions that you're allowing to be made on your behalf. Examine the assumptions that are, that are built into your thinking. I can't help thinking, though, that in order to achieve this awareness, to make a conscious use of the tools, you need to know how the tools are made. If you know what I mean, you cannot just be the user who 
pushes buttons and selects items from a drop-down menu that triggers functions that somebody else prepackaged for you. The functions cannot just be black boxes for you. I understand that a case can be made for the fact that you don't need to be a mechanic to be a good driver for a car. So it's again a matter of balance, probably, but I cannot help thinking that to some extent you need to master your tools in order to make conscious choices. Sure, but it, you also have to keep in mind that if you're using, if you're talking about coding, then you're, then you're, are you talking about coding in the service of creating an artwork, in which case it might not matter if the code is, is original or if it, as long as it accomplishes the purpose that you needed to accomplish, it doesn't necessarily matter if you're borrowing someone else's or using something that, that comes as part of a package, as long as it, it's, as long as it in a straight, straightforward way accomplishes the purpose you're setting out for it. If, it, if, if you're talking about creating an artwork, then, you know, the same pitfalls are there. Are you simply using forms and ideas that, that other people have used many times over, uh, without any originality, then, then maybe the, the, concern is more about how the artwork turns out rather than how the code turns out. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on this. I apologize because during the past questions I have not been asking you about your work, but I'm actually very fascinated by this relationship between creativity and current technology and how we think and how we act. So. Thank you so much. I found your, your answers very interesting. I will go back now, though, to your work and what you do. And I will say that you were traveling through Europe a few months ago, and Belgium was one of the countries that you visited. And you came to Ghent, so we had a chance to meet. So we had a nice conversation that day, and I have learned something that struck me about your artistic practice, and that is the fact that you produce both installations and performances, but you almost always have different versions of the same piece that can be presented as an installation or a performance. So I'm interested in asking you a bit more about how you approach one and the other, how you define one and the other, where is the line, when does an installation in fact become a performance and vice versa, and uh, how is the process of transitioning, of turning one into the other? Sure. So I guess, it, you know, there, I do have an idea of what the difference is between a performance and an installation, but I wouldn't say that this is a, you know, a, a rigorous academic definition. It's more of a shorthand that, that we used it almost in a way to, to promote a work or an event and to maybe give a prospective audience a, a sense of what's kind of expected of them. Um, I think the main difference between an installation and a performance for us is that an installation is something that uh, an audience will come and go to. They will uh, visit the installation, walk around, stay as long as they want. Uh, performance, though, typically has a beginning and an end. And uh, so th that would kind of be this the the main difference is that installations are sort of of whatever duration the audience member decides it's going to be, whereas a, uh, a performance, we do we decide the duration, and when people come in, they sit down, they watch the performance. So that creates, of course, issues when you're trying to do performable installations because. If it's both an installation that people can visit, but it's also going to be a performance, then we have to figure out, well, how are you going to to promote that or, or what should, how do people behave? Should they be sitting there? Should they be wandering around? And we've tried different things and we're sort of continuing to work on that. It, the complicated part is we don't want the audience to feel uncomfortable because they feel like they're behaving in a way that the artist doesn't want them to. Typically, if an installation, people come into a room where a work is installed and I'll maybe use ex vitro as an example, uh, because uh, we just we just presented this, but I can maybe draw on some other examples as well. But so in ex vitro, there are three uh, plexiglass, they're sort of objects in the shape of windshields that are suspended uh, from the ceiling. So they're hanging at about eye level in the space. Each of them uh, is both a projection or surface, so that even though they're translucent, 
Uh, they've been coated in a material that will allow uh, video projection to uh, be retained on the surface of the object, and it will be visible from both sides. So you can actually walk around uh, each of these windshields and see what's going on from all of them at the same time. Also, uh, each of the windshields is wired in such a way that it uh, is a loudspeaker, so we're sending sort of a low frequent or a low amplitude signal. There's a little transducer attached to the windshield, and so the, the windshield vibrates and the sound actually emanates from the windshield. And in the installation, you can wander around in between. If you put your ear closer to one windshield, you'll hear more of that sound versus another sound. Um, and that's and we that was fine. We had we had the installation up and running for a while, but then at a certain point, you know, the performer entered. And as soon as, as she entered the space, you know, the audience quickly emptied out of out of the installation space and gravitated towards the edges of the room. And we had set up a few chairs, but pretty much everybody decided to sit down and went and grabbed a chair, even if uh, there wasn't enough chairs for everyone to sit. So uh, and then it became a performance, and the the musician was had a, a radio like a radio microphone wireless mic so she could wander around and she could sing uh and her the the sound of her voice would then get processed by the installation and would come out through the, the sound sounding windshields as well so it, it was still built from the same sound because we also used her her voice as part of the sonic material that's in the in the installation uh but it, it sort of adds an extra level to it when she's actually doing it live whether or not that's the best situation, I'm not exactly sure because it's it's still a little bit awkward to, to, to shift from installation to performance, and uh, we're continuing to experiment with these with these things. But I can't say that we find a really fully satisfactory solution. Um, in a way, it's just easier if it's just an installation or just a performance. Every the audience seem more comfortable. So maybe the future for us in this way might be not to try to do both or to say this is an installation and then we're going to have a performance at a certain time and close the installation and then reopen it for the performance. You didn't show up empty-handed today for this episode of Technoculture. You shared some uh, audio excerpts from your works with me, and I think that this is a good moment to share with our audience an excerpt from Ex Vitro, which you have just mentioned. Ex Vitro is a work uh, of 2018 created by you, Brent Lee, together with Sigi Torinus and Megan Queen performing. The excerpt is two minutes long. Exactly.
both an installation and a performance can be interactive. So I would like to ask you about interaction in your works. How important is it for you to engage the audience that way? And what are the strategies that you've explored so far to do that? Sure. Um, so one thing that we found very early on in the Noise Border Ensemble is that depending which artistic tradition we were coming from, we had different ideas about the nature of what interactive typically meant. For musicians and composers, interactive means that, that it's a piece where uh, there's some interaction between the live performer and some sort of a, a system, typically you know, a, a computer system with sound processing or something like that that's uh, developed in Max is the most common one, but people do it in pure data or even build their own systems in some way. But it's, it's definitely between the performer who's, part, who's an artist and part of the presentation and, and the piece. Whereas the people in our group that are coming from a visual arts tradition have their sense of interactive was always, well, no, this is for the, the gallery visitor gets to interact with the artwork directly. There's no, it's not a question of interpreting the artwork or uh, doing some performing the artwork for an audience. It's, it's a more of a direct relationship between the artwork and, and the viewer. And so we've tried, we've done, we've done different things and, and we have created pieces where, uh, they are designed to be interactive for the viewers, for the gallery visitors. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple couple of examples. Uh, one one could argue that that installations are often interactive simply because they invite uh, viewers to engage with the space interactively in the sense that they they get a different view of the work or a different sense of the work or a different experience of the work depending on how they navigate the space. And uh, so just inviting people to walk through, for example, a certain path. We created a work at, uh, in uh, Norway, I guess it was in 20, I want to say 2015, um, at the Kunstmuseet in Olesund. And it was a version of an installation that was created by Sigi Turinus, my, my colleague, as well as Andreas Sunder Plasman, another collaborator of mine. She's in Germany. Uh, based in Berlin, Siggy and Andrea have been actually working on on a project for many years that they call Browsing Beauty, and it always it's always a site specific project. It's always an installation, but there's often a, a, some sort of a performance element or audience interactive element in, in however they do it. But they make different versions of the piece depending on on where it's being produced and and the situation, and who's there and who's interested in being involved. And in this particular case, uh, they decided that they would it's a projection based piece. It uh, was installed in a fairly large space in the gallery, and uh, there were hanging uh, screens, I guess, or fabric screens that created almost, I wouldn't say a maze because it wasn't complicated, but it created pathways through the space. And because of the, the nature of, the, of both the material uh, in the, uh, the screens and also the, the quality of the light and the projections being projected on them, um, the images would be quite sharp on the first screen, but it would become more diffuse as the, the light would go through, you know, several screens. So closer to the back of one side, it might be quite a, a blurred image, but there might be something projected from another vantage point that would create a sharper image. And uh, so in that case, the interaction is just simply people walking through, having different experiences and so on. But in other cases, uh, you will you know, invite the audience to, to for example, um, play an instrument, make a sound, uh, simply by motion, for example. You can, you can create an artwork by if you've got a camera and tied to a max patch, someone moving can basically be part of, part of whatever is, is displayed. I think, so that's, that's mostly the kinds of things we've tried, using either sensors of some kind, including you know, cameras and microphones, but also motion sensors. Uh, light sensors to track something that's going on in the space, which which could easily be uh, an audience member rather than a performer. The issue, though, for for us has has really become that there's sort of a limit to what you can expect of an audience member in terms of of contributing, in terms of of, of making making the work special. Um, one example that I might might give is uh, we have a piece called subatomic time 
which I guess has been, we've done it in different versions in different places over the years. It, it was first presented, I think, 2010. Um, but for the, I guess, maybe 2014, we did a version of this piece at a festival in Quebec, in Saguenay, called the uh, Festival de Musique de Création. And uh, they invited us to do this piece at the festival on the first night of the festival. But they wanted us to leave up the piece for the audience to interact with. And maybe if I describe it a little bit, it'll make more sense. But the piece is for a solo percussionist. There are seven sections to the piece. And in each section, the percussionist plays different instruments. In most of the sections, the instruments are there. There's either microphones or a camera or a sensor or something mounted to the, uh, to the instrument itself that then those signals are processed and and uh, Siggy and I are actually in a live performance uh, controlling and mixing the video and the audio as the percussionist performs and we're sort of improvising in some cases with the percussionist and in some cases we're just simply making sure everything's working the way it's supposed to work. But what the percussionist is capable of doing after rehearsing a lot and trying a lot and knowing what's going to be effective, what kinds of gestures, what kinds of uh, movements, um, we've you know, so that work has evolved into something I think aesthetically much more sophisticated than you could expect from someone that just wanders into the installation. And so when we set it up as more of an audience interactive installation, they could still come in and they could you know hit a drum or bang a gong or play a play a bongo or something like that. And uh, they would still they would get the response from the installation, but the musical result and the, the sort of visual and, and sonic gestures they would make would, would always be on a pretty low level or pretty a pretty obvious thing. For example, one of the uh, sections of the piece is called RG Bongo, and there are several bongo drums set up. Um, each of them has a, a microphone attached to it. One is is then used to control the amount of red in the video, one the amount of green in the video, one the amount of blue in the video, and another drum is actually used to advance frames of the video. So you could actually, if you play the drum really quickly, the video goes fast, and if you just play it, if you stop playing it, the video stops, and you have to sort of advance it by playing the drum. And anybody can do that. You could walk up and hit the drum, and you'll if you hit the red drum, the, the image will become more red. If you hit the green drum, it becomes more green. If you hit the red and green at the same time, it'll become more yellow. Um, and you can advance the video. And it's sort of fun to play with as sort of an interactive toy because it's a bit surprising that, you know, playing the drum like that will produce an interesting change in the video. But what the percussionist is able to do with it is, is actually make really interesting sonic and visual gestures out of it because he's rehearsed with it, he's thought about it. Um, we worked on it for a long time, so I think that's more what we're interested in. In when we when it, when we think of interactive installations, is the kind of things that a that a trained musician could do, or even somebody that's just spent a little bit of time thinking about the possibilities, as opposed to setting up an installation where someone can wander in and just by walking trigger some kind of an event. Um, not to say that that can't be surprising and and uh, fun and interesting, but uh, I think we have a little bit more of a, of a traditional view, perhaps, that that for the work that we're trying to make, we also, you know, there's sort of an expressive aspect or a, a more sophisticated aspect to the uh, to the performance that we want to bring out. What I find interesting, what I just brought home from what you said, is that one thing is the user design and the quality of this design. And one thing is the ability to achieve the desired effect easily with no training at all. But there is also a third element that is how sophisticated the effect you want to achieve is. And of course, these three elements are correlated, but regardless of the technology employed, of the interaction strategy, so regardless of how you want to label one of these works, at the end of the day, what makes the big difference is how sophisticated the effect you want to achieve is, and more precisely, how sophisticated the aesthetic idea you had in the first place. I think the label does tie into that because that in, going back to your original question, you know, when the, our percussionist stands up and plays that piece, it's a performance. But when an audience member is wandering around that setup and, and playing the piece and so on, playing with the different instruments, it's really an installation. I wouldn't think of them as performers in the same sense. So in a way, the label does tie in with the, the, the presentation of it. 
But let me give you another example because that's it's not just the technology that uh, that's the key to it. It's also the sense of sensibilities and the musical or, or visual sensibilities of the performer. I, I have a, an installation that I've, I've installed a couple of times, but only here in Windsor. I haven't done it anywhere else yet. Um, it's a it's a simple piece. It, it's a three channel video installation with a live live mixing component. Once again, there's an algorithm that's that's controlling the mix of of the source video and the sort of subtle changes in coloration in the source video. And uh, at the same time, in the middle of the space, there's a grand piano. The piano lid is open, and uh, inside the piano uh, are several ebos, and an ebo is like a little device that electric guitarists use so that they can create sustained sounds without having to pluck the strings. It basically in, in creates a, causes the string to vibrate through by having an electrical current in the uh, in the ebo. And uh, so in this piece, you know, there are ebos placed on the piano strings when the, the sustain pedal is forced to be down all the time. So if you place them on the strings carefully, you can actually cause the, the piano strings to vibrate. And then that sound is recorded and processed uh, in synchrony with one, at, least, at least one of the uh, video installations. So and, and it, in the sort of installation version of it where there's no performance, that, that the sound is continuous. It's very kind of a, a certain kind of a peaceful, slowly evolving kind of sound. It's a very consonant sound because if I'm going to choose a chord for these, for these strings, I'm going to choose something that I think goes well with the video. But theoretically, someone else could come in and move those ebos around and create quite a dissonant chord or create other sounds in the piano be possible. But... I don't think, you know, as a, as a sort of, in a way, the composer of the piece or the author of the piece, I don't think I would allow or want to have any kind of sound that's possible to be, to be part, of, part of a presentation of that piece. So I'm actually working now on, on some kind of a score. So if someone else wanted to do it, they would have some choices perhaps, but within certain possibilities that there's only certain kinds of musical gestures that you could make, certain kinds of harmonies that would be allowed. Um, in order to, to sort of, I think, retain sort of an identity for the piece that it is uh, focused in a way. And I, I really want the sound and the images to, to go together in a way that I think intuitively works well. So uh, it's, in that case, it's not just it's not the technology because the technology, anybody can manage the technology. I'm not doing anything when I perform that anything different from anybody else could do technically. But it, it's more just an understanding of, of, of harmony and music and what kind of harmony, if you put the, the ebos on these strings, you're going to get, say, for example, a, a minor seventh chord. That will probably go well with the installation, but if you just randomly put them on and get a very dissonant sort of atonal chord, that might not work as well. Why don't we listen to an excerpt of R.G. Bongo, which is taken from Subatomic Time, a piece of 2010, which you've just mentioned, in its version as a performance. This piece was created by you, Brent Lee, together with Sigi Torinus and Nick Papador. The excerpt is about a minute and a half long, and Nick is playing the percussions. Thank you. 
these are complex words. Music is just one of the elements. I have personally enjoyed this uh, excerpt very much and also the one we listened to earlier on. So I find the sonic part enjoyable on its own. But of course, it's meant to be part of a larger system and the work is meant to be experienced in person, directly. Now, for those of us who are not lucky enough to do that, you have some videos online that have some sort of aesthetic quality to them. At least this is the impression I've had. They try to convey a little bit of the feeling of uh, what it would be like to experience the work directly. Speaking of communicating the experience to uh, other places and in another time, are you concerned with documenting these works, with the obvious complexity that comes with it, the challenge, uh, in the short term and in the long term? Therefore, are you concerned with the preservation of these works? Well, uh, we do face face challenges, of course, because uh, you know technology evolves. Um, certain you know hardware. Uh, breaks becomes unavailable, certain software it becomes obsolete and it, or the new version of the software doesn't work the same way as the old version of the software does. So there are, our attitude really in the noise border ensemble, and I'm, so I'm not saying this is the attitude of, of everybody by any means, but with our attitude we've really taken a sort of the idea that each of our performances is to some extent at least occasion specific and site specific. So I mentioned the subatomic time piece, and we, it's been a few years now since we performed that piece. But over a period of about five years, I guess, we did it several times in different places. But over those, those years, we were able to make, first of all, we didn't really run into issues of things not, not functioning. Within five years, the thing, nothing had become so obsolete that we couldn't either build another one if it was broken. For example, we used a sensor, the original one we had, we were it was clumsy <laughs> in the way that we had soldered it, and so we built another one, and it was better because we were actually better able to build it at that point. But uh, we had no 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 real issues with the the software, although every single time there's certain calibrations and things that have to be done to get the software to work properly. Um, but more to the point, we we actually would alter alter the piece if we had a new idea that that we come up with because of our other experience. We had new skills, we were better able to do things, some things that we would do by hand, we knew now how to automate and would make it work better, or uh, some some efficiency that we've been able to find because we've done other pieces. We just incorporated in the new version of the piece. So in a, in a way, in terms of preserving the work, I guess we're not really concerned so much about preserving our work except in as much as that we will want to present it again, and uh, but we know that we will allow ourselves leeway to change the piece as we need to, and if there's something becomes not possible, we'll come up with another solution. The core of that particular piece is there's there's a sort of conceptual core around it. There's certain ideas that have sort of governed the way that we do it. It's very much a piece about about. Uh, scale, the very tiny and the very uh, expansive, and there's also a lot of uh, connections between uh, visual and sonic uh, techniques. For example, let's say, uh, like a say, for example, a panning technique where you can use panning as a camera shot, but you can also use panning as moving an audio signal from one speaker to another, just as for one example. But there's a, a number of sort of parallels like that that are built into it. Those, those don't become obsolete, those don't need to change. Um, at the same time, uh, there's a set of sonic gestures. Um, some of it is, in, is actually notated in a score, and some of it which is uh, more improvised, but improvised within parameters that we're aware of and that we're consistently reproducing. Um, and those gestures are very much tied to that, that piece. And so if we were to create a complete, even if the interactivity was completely different, I think it would still feel a lot like the same piece if it had that, that, those concepts and that sound and those projections. I could imagine a non-interactive version of subatomic time. That it would still, we'd still consider that a version of the piece, just a non-interactive one. And for many of our pieces, especially the performance pieces rather than the installation pieces, there is a non-interactive piece where, for example, a live musician can perform the piece with a fixed recording and a fixed video, 
and that's a version of it. But at the same time, there's a, uh, the interactive version where the live performer interacts with the software, the, the sound will respond, or the video more likely will respond to what the live musician is doing. And because that usually takes at least an extra person, sometimes two people, to produce that version of the work, it's less portable. Um, it's, it's also more prone to something going wrong in a performance. So it's okay you know, for us to, to either one of them either either version of a piece is fine so we're not so worried about about what happens in performance we're not less worried about about what version exactly something is because i think the audience can get something from it we'll get something of the ideas the sound is still there the music is still there it might be different but it's still there the visuals are still there in terms of the, the long-term preservation though that's a little bit more of a challenge um i think in terms of the long-term preservation, we're more concerned about documentation as a preservation strategy rather than trying to, like when I say documentation, I'm talking about simple audio visual documentation, making video and audio recordings of the piece. We do, you know, preserve the mass patches. We preserve the hardware as much as we can. But uh, in a way, if, if, if we want, you know, people to be able to appreciate the work in 20 years or 30 years or after we're gone, they would probably be appreciating it through by watching a video or and listening to an audio recording. That's fine for for me. Uh, I don't know that it's so necessary that the work could be mounted in a live situation again. Um, for a lot of the multimedia performance pieces, there there are fixed versions, so you don't wouldn't have to worry about the interactivity. Um, I don't know. Maybe. There might be some case where there's a, an installation that we think, you know, this is this is really uh, profound or dramatic or interesting or compelling or whatever, in such to such an extent that we really want to preserve this exactly the way it is and be, have it be able to tour from gallery to gallery or have a gallery be able to purchase the work or something like that, and then we would have to deal with exactly how it would be preserved over time. But Right now, our strategy for most of our work is simply to try and get very good uh, multi-camera video documentation, um, good audio documentation. We also, of course, we, we write about our work, um, either you know in conference presentations or just in, in notes, and uh, that's easy to preserve. So those there really isn't much of a preservation challenge. We count on video being preservable and audio being preservable and text being preservable, I don't, you know, that's easy to transfer from one medium to another uh, as to, uh, going forward. So that's not an issue. But preserving the work to, if we were more attached that the work had to be done this exact way, then it would be more of an issue for us. But for us, it's not so much an issue. We are going to have another musical break now. We listen to an excerpt of your performable installation called Natural Planes of Separation from 2016. You offered two recordings to me, one of a live performance and one of the installation operating from an algorithm in Max, which is what we're going to listen to right now. The duration of the excerpt is one minute and 30 seconds.
video is certainly one of the best ways to pack a lot of information into one document. And you have videos about your works online, as I mentioned earlier. I would like to ask you what your intention was in producing these videos and in sharing them online. The videos that we put online, the sort of clips, they're definitely meant to give people an idea of what the work is about. The primary purpose of putting them there is, well, there are two. One is that, so people, if we're talking like we are today about the work, someone can, can go and watch it and look it up, or I can say, oh yeah, we're talking about this. You can go check out you know, our Vimeo page or our webpage or whatever, and actually understand what we've done in the past. And it's also, you know, if, 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 uh, if we're proposing a work to a festival or something like that, uh, for some event, we can then use it as as a, like part of an application material. You can link to well, here's what the video is like, and certainly we put effort into making the video. It's not we don't just set up a camera and turn it on and and then turn it off at the end. We we use multiple cameras and we set it up. We try and give a sense of what the experience is to be to to be at the performance to see the performance. We you know, we edit them carefully. We have. Um, either we do it ourselves or we have, you know, students that, that, that are uh, research assistants that will help us with that. And mostly they're visual artists and they will spend the time making, making good video for us. Um, so they serve multiple things. It's not, uh, with, with installations, that's more what it is. With the, with the video pieces that are, that are performances, typically we don't, we don't want to post the whole version of the video on because we want to be able to present it either in a gallery or in a performance. And so we're more likely, more likely just to put a clip, a clip up to give people a sense of it. We do have in, in most cases sort of full length videos. For example, the subatomic time, we've got clips from different sections. We actually have kind of a collage clip that was created by by a couple of our uh, research assistants who were artists themselves um, which included other things and it was kind of an interesting take on that piece but we also there was a filmmaker that made like a 45 minute documentary about that piece there are even two versions of that film there's one where she interviews us during at different points in it and there's one that's just a performance a film of the whole performance from beginning to end um, so the 40, then it's 45 minute film. We haven't posted that anywhere because again, that might be screened in a festival or something like that. Um, so, so with the clips, it's those three things. One is, is showing people what we've done. One is for proposing new projects, new, uh, presentations. And then the third is, uh, also the, the, is, is so the, the third idea is that the clip is there to give you a sense of it without actually putting the whole thing online. Are you often a performer in your own works when there's live music? Yes. I play the saxophone, so I actually have a whole project called the Homestyle Project, which is just me playing the saxophone, usually the saxophone, sometimes I play another instrument, and then I make all the video and I make all the uh, the max patches and everything myself, but and I, that is, I perform, I can do a whole set of those pieces. Um, those are multimedia performance pieces, those aren't installation pieces, but I'm performing those for sure. Earlier on in this interview, you mentioned improvisation. I normally think of jazz when somebody says improvisation. Not only, I know, but for the most part, I think of that. I would like to ask if you see a parallel or a difference in which one between jazz improvisation and improvisation uh, with traditional instruments, but also, for example, uh, electroacoustic instruments or laptops. That's a that's a complicated question because because it depends on what, what your definition of jazz is. Um, I think when people typically think of jazz, they think of sort of classic jazz, which has become more of a performance tradition rather than a creative tradition. Even though, of course, there's tremendous creativity involved in 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 improvising. But if you're improvising in the style of Miles Davis or John Coltrane or um, something like that. It's really, it's more of a performance tradition and the way jazz is typically taught, at least in North American universities, is you're learning to play like the great masters played in the same way that you learn to play the piano, like great masters of the piano repertoire, you know, played. Um, whereas, you know, there's also, of course, there's, there is new jazz being created. That's not, doesn't sound like, sort of, you know, post bop of the 1950s and 60s. Um, and in that situation, it's very hard to say, you know, where does, where does sort of 
you know, where does the improvisation end and where does the composition begin? And uh, I would say for, for the kind of improvising that I'm doing, it's influenced, they deeply influenced by jazz, but I don't know if I would call it jazz. I like, there's a quote by uh, Jan Garberek, who's a Norwegian saxophonist who started out definitely as a more traditional jazz player, very heavily influenced by, by Coltrane, and he played that kind of music for years. But evolved, he's evolved in, you know, very different style of music now, very influenced by uh, Norwegian folk music. And he was, and I read in an interview with him that, that he said that, you know, he doesn't know that he would call what he does now jazz, but he knows that he wouldn't be able to do it except that he started out as a jazz musician. So I kind of think the same way about a lot of my work. I was, you know, classically trained as a composer. I did play some jazz, but, you know, not at a high level. Um, and, but so, so it's influenced by it, but I don't know that I would call it jazz. I would like to thank you for taking the time to be on Technoculture. We would like to bring this episode to a close by sharing another excerpt from one of your works. This is called Nabo. It's from 2015. And this is a soundtrack that you made for the installation of Sigi Torinus and Andrea Sunder Plasman. The excerpt is two minutes and a half long. And I thank you again very much for being with us. That was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. <laughs>